Uh, this is a great summer. Everybody's in and out of town and hope you're getting a good time to get away, get some vacation, but it's good to have you here. And uh, get, did you guys all have a great Father's Day? Huh? They take care of you? Some of you aren't awake yet. You're not shaking. Yes, one way or another. I bet none of you have on socks today with pictures of your grandchildren on them. I do, because I'm more spiritual than you right now. I got them. No, we had a great Father's Day. It was a great time just to hang out with my son, my daughter, uh, their spouses, our grandkids, just to chill out. And we honor you. There's a lot of great fathers, grandfathers, stepfathers, spiritual fathers here. Uh, and we're so glad you're here. And guys that are with us for the first time, even those that come one time a year and whether they need it or not, uh, we're glad you're here. But uh, it's a great, great time to gather together. Father's Day is a great day. Did you see that meme? Somebody sent me a meme. Uh, a dad's got his arm around his son and it's kind of one of those tender moments and he said, I'm a great dad, aren't I Bobby? And the caption says, my name is Billy. <laughs> um, but uh, we are... We are seeking to become great men as God defines greatness. We're growing. We're not perfect men. There's not a perfect man in this room. Uh, but we are called to, to know the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. We make mistakes. When we sin, what do we do? We run right to him because that's what the cross is all about. We ask forgiveness and we're growing. We're better husbands, better fathers, better grandfathers than we were by the grace of God. So, all right, now let me ask you this, because we're continuing our study in the book of Judges. This is week two in the book of Judges. And how many of you are getting a chance to read the book of Judges? Yeah, some of you read it? Good, good, good. You know, it's one of those books that the Church of Jesus Christ looks at and said, what is this doing in the Bible? I mean, it's one of the most violent books of the Bible. If you like war movies, you like the book of Judges. Because that's what it is. But it is a crazy book. But it is a, it's, it's a very important and timely book for us. So let me ask you the question, what kind of life do you want to live? Uh, deep down in every man, there, there, there are deep longings. Deep desires that we have. And I think that if, if a man taps down deep, he wants to live a life of significance. Not one of us woke up today and said, I just want to have a mediocre life. I just want to waste my life. Now, some of us just want to have fun. I, I get that. But deep down, God has wired us for deep significance. And the whole theme of the book of Judges is that unless a man has the proper king in his life, he can't live that life of deep significance. Uh, so the book of Judges is really why men need the king, the right king. And that's what this book is about. But you're going to see as we jump into it today that this has incredible applications to us. Now, Judges is the seventh book in the Bible. It follows the book of what? Joshua. And we know about Joshua. And you remember, let's see if I have that PowerPoint. Do we have the PowerPoint? Did we get it? What were, there it is. We remember in Joshua, uh, in the book of Joshua that we studied uh, in 2022, that, that Joshua leads Israel to actually take the conquest of the land of Canaan, right? Moses led them out of Egypt. Joshua led them into the land to take, to take and, and, and win the land of Canaan. And so Joshua's uh, uh, promotion, his, his strategy was to cut the nation in half, go right through the center, up through Jericho, then go south, then go north. Was it a successful campaign? Absolutely it was. The Israelites grabbed the whole territory of, of Israel, but the, the fact of the matter is, it's just impossible when you think about what they did. I mean, here's all these slaves that, that came out of Egyptian bondage. They've been in Egyptian bondage for over 400 years. And all of these slaves taught to fight in the scorching deserts of Sinai with insufficient weapons, with no supply chain at all, and they went into the land of Canaan and took the high places, the people that were entrenched, the entrenched enemies. They actually won an impossible battle. How did that happen? 
Because God fought with them, God fought for them. God is the God of the impossible. And men, in the church today, we need to keep that in mind, that God is the God of the impossible. What is impossible to us is very possible to him. Catch this, there are no limits to what omnipotence can do. And it's important for the men of the church, as we think about Joshua, to keep that macro picture of how big God is, because we tend to we tend to downsize God. One of my professors in Bible college years ago he used, to, used to open the class by saying, how big is your God? Well, he's big. No, he said, no, how big is your God? And for many of us in the church of Jesus Christ, uh, he, he, uh, we have a very small God. But we need to understand he's a big God. Here's, here's something that I think about every day. It's on one of my three by five cards that I go over every day. Attempt something so impossible that unless God is in it, it's doomed to failure. And gentlemen, that's what I'm about. That's what, that, that's what I'm about. That's what Forge is about. We're trying to reach, um, uh, create a movement of men influencing all of the greater Orlando area. Beyond if God wants to do that, but we want to reach the greater Orlando area and every man. And it takes a man to reach a man. It's impossible. Can't be done by human effort. But, but with God, all things are, are, are possible. And, and God wants us to live, gentlemen, not with small goals, but with big goals. Young guys, you got to get that. God doesn't want you to live a life of medi mediocrity. He wants you to live a big life, and we're going to be talking about that. And so, as we get to Joshua, as we get through, through Joshua, we've got the land. Now, the question is... When Israel took over all of Canaan, did they really have all of the land? Did they have it all? Answer to that, no. They had the, the general territory, but they didn't have a lot of, a, they got their tribal allotments. How many tribes were there, guys? Twelve tribes. They got their tribal allotments, but did they have, did they, did they actually have possession of all of the territory throughout all of Canaan? Answer, no. So now we're in phase two. When we come to the book of Joshua, we're in phase two of the conquest. And the question is, you've got the land, but can you keep it? Uh, the, the, there's a, a, an apocryphal story about what happened with, to Benjamin Franklin after the Constitutional Convention. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about, in uh, 1787, he walks out of the Constitutional Convention and this lady said to Benjamin Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what do we have, a republic or a monarchy? And he says, Madam, we have a republic, if you can keep it. He said, Madam, we have a republic, if you can keep it. A republic is not easy to keep. Uh, it's not easy to keep freedom. Uh, and, and so now, when, when you get through Joshua, and Joshua's gone, and you come to the time of the judges, the question is, what did they have? Did they have a monarchy, or did they have a republic? They had a monarchy, guys. They had a theocracy. A theocracy is the best kind of government that you can have. That is, the rule, a monarchy, by God. And that's what a theocracy is, and that's what they had. The question is, could they keep it? Could Israel keep it? The book of Judges is about could they keep living as men, women, children, tribes, a whole nation that were really following God's covenant of grace. He made a gracious covenant with them. I, I, I accept you Israelites. You're my people. And, and by the way, they were a special people in the sense that they were the conduit of Messiah to the rest of the world. So they had that very real sense that their uniqueness as a nation wasn't just for them. Did God save them out of bondage? Answer, yes. Did he save them for themselves? Answer, no. They were to be a conduit to the rest of the world. And as we go in and study uh, judges together, we're going to see there's direct parallels to us as the church of Jesus Christ today. And that's why we need to keep that in mind. And so uh, I, I want us to jump into it and take a look here. First of all, you've got your outline. Take a look. I got three points. It'll be easy. Three points. 
Three points in a poem. That's what all pastors do, right? So I got three points for you today as we walk through uh, Ch Joshua chapter one. Let's take a look first of all at the exciting exploits of Judah and Simeon. Judah and Simeon with the tribal allotments. Judah is the biggest tribe. Does anybody? This is a trivia question. You don't need to know this, but where's Judah's allotment? Anybody know where Judah's allotment? North or south? South. How big is it? It's the biggest tribe, and it's mostly in the Negev, in the desert. And Simeon is factored in there. Simeon, Simeon's kind of in there with Judah. And so, so catch this. Uh, I'm going to walk through these verses with you. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the word Canaanite is the, is the overall term that you give to the different peoples that were living in the land of Canaan, but there's all kinds of them, right? All the Ites, Hivites, Jebusites, Perizzites, uh, all the Ites. Uh, but in general, we can call them the Canaanites, all right? So uh, the Lord said Judah. I don't know how the Lord did it, but he communicated probably through one of the priests that Judah was to be the tribe to lead the conquest Chapter 2, phase 2. Judah shall go up. Behold, I've given the land into his hand. What's the promise? Judah goes up, take your territory, I've given it to you. Notice that promise, don't miss that. I've given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And likewise, uh, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, uh, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek, was the name of the city. They found Adonai Bezek, Adonai is the word Lord, Lord Bezek, the leader, uh, the, the human leader of that uh, city. Uh, they found Adonai Bezek at Bezek, interesting. And they fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And, and Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterwards, by the way, that's what they did back then, right? When you took over a city, you set it on fire. And this is how archaeologists have come back over the years and gone through different layers uh, over in Israel and other cities. And they've been able to determine archaeologically the evidence for other civilizations. Why? Because they found different burn layers. Because that's what it did. And that's how they, archaeologists today have substantiated so much of the Bible because they found these burn levels uh, that they did and, and tapped it into time. This is true history. Uh, afterwards, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country and the Negev and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now, the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, and they defeated Sheshai, Imon, and Talmi. Why in the world does he tell us that? Why in the world does God tell you uh, that, that Hebron was formerly named Kiriath Arba? How many of you feel blessed by that this morning? <laughs> does that just touch your soul? And, and the guys that defeated Sheshai, Achman, and Talmai. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You, you know why those are there? Those are indicators because that's true history. The Bible is not uh, a, a mythological story. It's true history of stuff that actually happened, and they write what actually happened, and the biblical authors tell us the supernatural aspects of what God did. Yes, there is that, but there's all kinds of these historical things that are just factored into the book of Judges that say, oh yeah, this was an eyewitness who wrote this down and let us know that this is true stuff. And you and I as Christian men need to understand that this is not a myth, that the Bible is true and can be trusted. All right, that's for free. But this is really exciting. I like this. Uh, you know, many of the men um, of Judah and Simeon probably did see themselves as warriors. I mean, after 25 years, if you were in the army for 20, or Marines, 
for 25 years and you've been fighting almost constant battles for 25 years, what would your self-identity probably be? Probably as a warrior, right? However, you'd probably be tired. We're going to see that some of these guys did not see themselves as warriors anymore. And, they, and they, we're going to see this. You, you give up your identity. By the way, Forge, we talk about our purpose, right? Our identity is that we're God's deeply beloved, redeemed sons through Jesus Christ. We have a purpose. We're leaders, worker providers, warrior ambassadors. When you give up your warrior status, you begin to capitulate to culture. That's a big idea that you got to keep in mind. And that's what we're going to learn from the book of Judges. And these guys, we're going to do that. We're going to see that in a minute. But I want you to also note an, an important historical thing. That God's original plan was not to win the land right away. Listen to what it says way back in Exodus 23. God says, I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. You see, so God's plan was exactly that Joshua would get the big land and under the judges they would get these different tribal allotments over time. That the Israelites were to continue advancing the kingdom of God in Israel bit by bit. If you let your lands go, what happens? They become overgrown. They're crazy. And so God, God, this was God's plan that the judges would go in and do it this way. Um, at this point, um, they went in and we saw what happened to Adonai Bezek. Some of you were going, hey, that's pretty cool. This God of the Old Testament is, uh, is, is, is unique. And uh, yes, he is. But what happened to Adonai Bezek and war, if you've been in war, you know, you know how traumatizing it really is. We see, we see war movies. And, and we don't really understand the trauma. But those who've been there, I think training for war always makes a man better. Being involved long-term in combat almost always destroys a man. It's traumatic. It's terrible. And I'm not glorifying the war aspects of this. Uh, it was frightful, all war is. But as we look at what Israel was called to do, I want you to keep in mind that this was what Israel was called to do at this time. It is not, aren't you glad, what we're called to do now. Okay, We are not called with this unique calling to go in and wipe out the tribes around us or the people around us who, who don't believe. I know it's, for some of you it saddens some of you. <laughs> um, You'd like to wipe out those pagans and just get, because the craziness that's all around us. But listen to what uh, Dale Ralph Davis, one of my favorite Old Testament scholars on this note said. He said, but people who bemoan the poor fate, the fate of the Canaanites. You know, there's a lot of people who read the Bible and they go, oh, those poor Canaanites. Oh, those poor Canaanites. It's just Israel comes up and wipes them out, those poor guys. He says, they forget one vital fact. They don't view the conquest from the Bible's perspective. The Canaanites were not innocent. Moses was emphatic about that. He humbled the Israelites by insisting that Yahweh was not giving them Canaan because they were such godly folks, but because the Canaanites were so grossly wicked. God did not choose Israel because they were good. No, they were, they were a messed up group of people. He chose them because he decided to love them, but the Canaanites were worse. Never forget that, man. And when, when you run into somebody that says, oh, the God of the Old Testament is just so awful for judging the Canaanites, say, yeah, they were bad people. Let me give you more evidence of that. They were grossly wicked. If you want to go all the gory details, Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 18 as well. And they show that God had called Israel at this point to bring justice to these people. All right, now I did that. I went back and read Exodus 18 and Leviticus uh, and Deuteronomy 18 this past couple of weeks. And if you want, if you want to have, you know, sort of be thrown back in your, in your chair, go back and read those. Because what God says to the Israelites is, when you get into the land 
And then he lists like all of these sexual practices. This is the R-rated part of our, 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 our talk today, okay? Um, but I know I have your attention. Um, he says, if you want to see how bad they were and all of these regulations that he gives to the Israelites, there is sexual regulation after sexual regulation after sexual regulation after sexual regulation. And you go, God, what's the problem here? Here's the problem. The Canaanites were so bad sexually and in every way that he had to tell the Israelites, you're going in, you're going to take over this land. Your job is to get rid of them. But they're going to be there among you. Do not follow their sexual practices. And that's why he gives such regul regulative principles about their sexual practices. They were having sex within families. Fathers with kids, kids with mothers, stepmothers. The, a man would have sex with his wife's sisters. Um, they were having sex with anything that moved. With each other. With animals. Let that sink in. And God... God basically gives all of these regulations to Israel because the Canaanites were completely out of control sexually. Homosexuality was rampant. Uh, you, you, you can almost, they were sacrificing their children to demons, to the god Moloch. Can, can, you, can you get a picture for how bad the culture was at the time? And, and so it's important to understand that these sexual regulations were given to Israel because the culture around them was even worse. And they were to be God's holy people through whom the Messiah would come. And so they were to be different and righteous so that the world could see the difference. Clarification, we are not called to this ministry of of obliteration that was given to Israel at this time. You understand that, right? That is not the ministry of the church. Under Jesus Christ now, our king, we are not to go in and kill unbelievers. But that was the job of the Israelites back then. At this particular point in history, and not throughout their whole history, only at this point, because God had kingdom plans to bring the Messiah, Jesus, through whom the world world would find the one savior the king the judges is written to say hey we need a king you see see what's the verse in judges what's the key verse there was no king in israel every man did what was right in his own eyes you see and that was true for israel too that's what we'll see they had a theocracy could they keep it well they, they struggled to keep it but judah is this bigger tribe and they work together okay let me say one one last thing uh, about this, this is my longest point. Some of you are saying, wait, your time is almost up. Um, you only learned the first point. This is my biggest point. But, but Judah and Simeon work together to accomplish God's task. And uh, it, it's an important principle that when God calls his people to accomplish a task, they got to work together. That if we do work together, we can accomplish God's task. And Judah and Simeon prove that at this point. Uh, you say, what's that got to do with us? Well, yeah, here we have multiple churches, maybe 30 different churches represented here. And it's important for us to understand that together, corporately, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, we're the people of God now, right? Ephesians 2 says that Jew and Gentile in Christ have come together. We're the people of God now. We're the Israel of God now. We've got different tribes. Some of you are Presbyterians, some of you are Baptists, some of you are non-denominational, some of you are from small churches, some of you are from big churches, uh, but uh, we're one church in Jesus Christ. Right? Right? And you may say, hey, my church is better. That's okay. You can say, I used to say that all the time. The church I served was always, that's always good. You, can, you should be pro your church. But we're one church. You get that, guys? And that's vitally important for us to keep in mind. Otherwise, we start attacking each other. And a church that is 
theologically and biblically pure and stands together around Jesus Christ and what the Bible teaches is a part of the church. And we've got to work together. Simeon and Judah work together. And we can, do we have one king now? His name is Jesus. And he's given us a big mission. Wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're in this together, right? And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that's the number one thing to do. You want to be in the church, in the family, in the body of Christ. All right. All right, so I want you to understand uh, the, the exciting adventures of being used by God. And it was exciting for those guys back then. Is it exciting to follow Jesus Christ today? It should be. Let me give you some more. Secondly, real people, real stories, real history. I love this. Um, from there, uh, it says in Judges 1, verse 11, from there they went up against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. I know that blesses you. Again, I hope you are blessed by these historical things. And Caleb, Caleb is one of the great heroes of the book of Joshua, isn't he? Joshua and he were the two faithful spies. The two heroes in the book of Joshua are Joshua and Caleb. Man, they're old dudes right now. I love these guys. Um, and uh, so Caleb says, Caleb's 85, and he goes, all right, whoever attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I'll give him Asik, my daughter, for a wife. Holy cannoli. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. Othniel, we're going to see Othniel soon. He's the first judge. We'll see him in a bit. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And so, what did Caleb do? Gave him his daughter for a wife. This is great. Hey, let me, let me give you a truth. In history past, it was the dads and the moms, but mostly the dads, who sealed the weddings, who sealed the marriages. It was the dads who said, um, I've got to get a good wife for uh, my, my son. But it was the father of the girl who said, yeah, but he's got to prove himself. I mean, this was a time when if you wanted to have a wife, you had to prove yourself. You had to be a warrior. You had to have a job. You had to prove you could put the food on the table, young men. Go get a godly woman to marry, but prove yourself that you can pay for her and that you can care for her and you're hanging out with guys that will help you become uh, the best husband you can be, right? So uh, apparently Othniel proved himself, gave, uh, Caleb gave his uh, daughter to him. And I love this, when she came to Othniel, when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. So she comes and she's going to marry Othniel. She says, now you need to go ask dad for another field. Because men, they put us in the Negev, in the desert area. we got to grow some crops. She, did, he, did he marry a, uh, a mild-mannered woman? Heck no. He married Caleb's daughter. Are you kidding me? Right? A warrior princess. That's who, that's who he married. That's who he got. And then I love this. And, and then she went to her father. She dismounted from her donkey. And Caleb said to her, what do you want? Uh, have you ever had your, your, your kids come and you say, hey, Dad, I, I, I got a proposal for you. What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? She said to him, give me a blessing since you've set me in the land of the Negev. In other words, since you put me in a desert plot, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower sling springs as well. So what we see in, the, in, this, in this unfolding, real people, real situations, the real need for faith and courage to go along and, and build this land. We, need, we see courage in Othniel and, uh, uh, and, and we see it in this woman too. By the way, don't expect when you marry a woman today that you're probably going to marry a mild and mannered woman. They don't exist anymore in American culture. I mean, there's a couple of them, maybe. Uh, but um, but we, we are, young men, you guys are the, in the era of, of a culture that um, has been pro-woman for the last 30 years. And, and we men need to be good, godly, strong leaders, but we need to understand we're not marrying pushovers, and we need to, we need to develop them and love them and not expect that they will do just everything we want them to do. Stage of life. Um, 
All right, okay. It's a, now, I'm not going to go into this next part, verses 16 through 20. I'm not going to go into that. But one thing I do want to say to you is that, is that Moses' uh, father-in-law, his name was, anybody remember? Jethro, not the Beverly Hills Billy, Hell Billy, but Jethro was Moses' father-in-law. And it's a fascinating note of history that we see in verses 16 through 18, that all of Jethro's family, the Midianites, say, we see God at work among you and we want to be around you. So they moved in to Israel. They moved out, out of Midian and they wanted to be where God was. I love that picture of really the church of Jesus Christ, that our churches ought to really be doing life so differently that the world says, I don't agree necessarily with everything, but I want to learn. I want to, I want to be around you. You're educating your kids better. Uh, you're, you're raising up better husbands and better women uh, you, that, the, that the church, that the pagans would look at us uh, and want to be around us. Okay, so then we see that interesting thing going on. And, uh, and, and then we see, now we begin to see the slide. There's great success, uh, but, but when we get to Judges 1 verse 21, it says this, but the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. We do see uh, ongoing a bit more of, of success, but when you come down to Judges 1, 27, and the rest of that chapter, we see, let, let's just listen real quick. Verse 27, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of bet Verse 29, and Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants Asher did not out the, drive out the inhabitants. Naphtali, verse 33, did not drive out the inhabitants. 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country. Do you see the picture? What we begin to see is that after the early successes, we see the, the perpetual failing of Israel. They did not keep on the warrior status. And it affected them. So what's the big picture? The consequence of covenant breaking is found in Judges 2. Real quick, just say a couple of things here. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. God says to Israel, I made a covenant of grace with you, and I will never break it. Brothers, this is, this is something that Israel needed to take to heart. God called Abram, Isaac, Jacob, later. He called them and he said, I made a covenant of grace with you. You didn't earn it. I will never break it. You're going to go through some tough times in life, but understand that God never will break his covenant of grace with you. In Christ, when he says he loves you, he loves you. We live in a broken world with a lot of enemies all around us. He will never break his covenant with you. But as you read these verses, Israel broke their covenant with God. They broke their covenant with God, and God said, all right, I'm going to let you go your own way. I'm going to let you, you don't want to follow me. You don't want to trust me. You want to take on different gods. You want to do your own thing? Okay, I'll let you. But you will pay the consequences of suffering the reality of living in a pagan world without me. Let me wrap this up with applications and say this. The church is tasked with carrying on the Israel task of this time. They were to be God's people. Are we still in the covenant of grace time? Are you kidding me? Of course we are. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. We're still into the covenant of grace. In the Old Testament time, they looked ahead to the Messiah. We look back to the Messiah. He came. We're still saved by grace through faith in the Messiah. He hadn't come yet in the time of the judges. He's come. The tomb is empty, and so is the cross. But we, the church carry on this mission to the world around us, not in going out and obliterating them with bullets or swords, but bringing them into the church by confronting them with the truth claims of Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen again. 
We are the spiritual Israel now to carry this on. And we have to be careful because so often we think of the church of what Jesus has done for me. And what we need to think about is what Jesus has done for us. Too much of American Christianity is privatized and individualistic. Too many of us and too many churches say, what has Jesus done for you, 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 you? So we think that God just wants to make my, God is my cosmic genie that just wants to make my life great. No pain, no suffering. God's just, God's, God's my name it, claim it genie. Just rub the bottle, ask for what I want, and he gives it to me. I don't find that in the Bible. What you find is that we have the distinct privilege of being the people of God redeemed, forgiven, loved, and given deep significance to take the gospel to those around us. And it's important for us as Forge, but all men of all churches, to begin to think not just what has Jesus done for me, what has he done for us to bring us to be the people of God to a culture that is mad around us? And if you shake your head and said, I cannot believe what's going on around us, I do too. It's just what Israel had to face back then. It was crazy what they were doing. It wasn't R-rated, it was, it was X-rated. And that's the culture we live in. And yet we have been given the message to be God's men, women, and children in a culture that is absolutely out of control. Talk about it around the table. I'll get you out of here on time.
Time to hit the bricks. Hey, let's give it up for all those guys who are with us for the first time, all right? Thank you. We are glad you are here, guys. And uh, the dialogue continues. Uh, we, we, start, we started out, and it's got to continue during the week. I encourage you, over the summer, get together uh, as tables, as teams, as fire teams for lunch, breakfast, whatever, coffee. Uh, continue to talk about these things, encourage each other, pray for each other, uh, and get to know each other even, even better. And so uh, we have uh, deserted on a, a desert island. I mean, he was deserted there for years. And uh, finally, he, a, a boat pulls up, they find him, and, and, the, and, and, then, and they rescue this guy. And, and before they get him off the island, the, the guy looks at him and he says, uh, what are those three structures? He says, well, that's my house over there. He goes, well, what are the other two? And he goes, well, that's, that's my church. He goes, what's the other one? He goes, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> join a church, but there's no perfect church. And if you join it, you'll ruin it for crying out loud. Come on. But we are the people of God, uh, and it's important for us to have a kingdom perspective as we move ahead. Right? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for these men in all of their church. Thank you for their pastors, their staff. Thank you, Lord God, that you can make our churches Holy Spirit, make them holy. May we cling to the teaching of your word. May, may we not, as your people, give in to the culture around us. May we stand firm. May it start here. And may we, with winsome and love, even with our enemies, share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So be with my brothers, be with me, be with all of us as we go out into this culture that desperately needs us. For we pray these things in your strong and holy name, Lord Jesus. And God's men said, amen. amen. Go get them. T front tables, stay up. First two rows. Everybody else goes down. Oh, I appreciate you doing this. Thanks for bringing all yeah, that man, stuff. No, no problem. Hey, I'll touch base with you on Wednesday about it. Yeah, tomorrow. Great message. Tomorrow. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you.